Uh, great. So thank you everyone for coming out tonight. Um, really appreciate seeing so many faces uh, in the room and online or YouTube. Uh, so thanks again. Um, we're happy to present the first uh, multilingualism in Ireland workshop. And we're, kind of, we're just uh, kicking off tonight uh, with this roundtable discussion with uh, experts in uh, different aspects of multilingualism in Ireland. Uh, first to my right is uh, Luki Kambule, who is a uh, co-founder of MASI, the Movement of Asylum Seekers in Ireland. Uh, next to him is Lorraine Lee, Jeff Studies in Community College Dublin. She's also Vice Provost for EDI. Uh, and finally on our panel is uh, Professor Bettina Miga, who is a uh, full professor of linguistics in UCD um, with a specialization in multilingual. When we want to talk about multilingualism, we think about first Ireland as a nation um, with a, up until uh, we'll say 2017, uh, a bilingual state with Irish first uh, and English second as official languages. Uh, this has changed considerably over the years uh, and has also been strongly influenced by the number of languages used by individuals here in Ireland, um, formerly a net immigration state, which is now a net immigration state. Um, uh, perhaps I can, I can open this to uh, the panel. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, how multilingualism affects the work that you do uh, as an activist, as an academic, uh, as an individual living in Ireland? Okay, would you like to speak first? <clears throat> Yeah, thank you uh, for this opportunity to, to talk about this subject uh, from uh, the migrants' point of view. Uh, as people know that we work with uh, uh, people that come here to seek protection, the asylum seekers, and uh, it is a main, uh, I would say, a hindrance to, to most of the people that seek protection, uh, the language that uh, because everything that they find themselves in is in their foreign language. And uh, it becomes too challenging for them, and especially the first instance of people uh, uh, conducting the state uh, or the officials, uh, where the state is not prepared for a person that is coming with, with a different language that is uh, uh, <clears throat> And it's, it, this has been happening for, for a long time, and they have not really, really mastered the, the, the art of, of making sure that there is a person that is going to be able to uh, help that individual. Because when they come, they first are asked the reasons why they come here, and they don't even understand that question. And it becomes an issue then when they have to explain what happened to them, the instance that have happened to them, because it's not in their own language. And when they try uh, and they make errors, and those errors then affect them along the way in terms of the assessment of their, of their actual applications uh, because of that misunderstanding. And by that time, it's late to correct things. Uh, <clears throat> though, when they are asked maybe to call later for the interview, they are asked if they can get a translator, uh, which they, that is, um, it is affordable to them. But our concern is the mistakes that would have been uh, uh, happened initially, uh, of which we would have wanted to see a, a better intervention from the officials in terms of availing not only the documents that would be on, on the website in different languages, but to speak to a person that will be able to understand if you are coming from South America, if you are coming from uh, Central Africa, if you're coming from Asia, you must be able to be comfortable with a person that speaks your dialect. And that is what is still lacking up short so, of so, so over 20 years in that particular field uh, of, of the people. Uh, Somalians, for us, so, so many of, of, of the Somalians with Somalian uh, uh, languages find them, themselves that they get too easily isolated 
because of the lack of, of uh, comfort in terms of to speak people that, that, that speak with their, with their own language. You'll find that they are uh, in, in their clusters because they are comfortable amongst themselves. But when it comes to the official kind of communication, then that's a problem. And that's where we come in then with the people that we have been working with for a long time to help to do those translations in, in the work that we do, which is not a formal kind of a structure, uh, which is which is governed or funded uh, to be able to do deliver what we do. We do whatever that we can do in in the small uh, way that we can. Let's uh, stop there. Well, thank you for that, because that's going to give me a segue then into some of what I want to say. So I'm, I'm an interpreter. Um, I'm a sign language interpreter originally by training, and I work mostly with sign languages. But one of the, the challenges in the Irish context is exactly what you said, Lucky, that there, there has been actually a lack of taking on of the responsibility to provide appropriate interpreter education pathways for people and then to provide adequate interpreters in the Irish context. There are European directives in place that oblige the Irish government actually to have um, a, a register of interpreters who are appropriately trained, and yet we don't have that for legal context at all. In fact, in the Irish context, while sign language interpreters have access to a four-year interpreter education pathway, there is nothing for spoken language interpreters who are working in the community sector, other than through the Irish Refugee Council, where Hasina Kimbona has established a short program. That's not right. You know, this is a fundamentally, it's a question of equality. And it also, to my mind, is an issue that needs to be taken up with respect to the Irish Human Rights and Equality uh, Commission and our, our obligations under IREC with respect to the public sector duty. So I'm just going to jump right in and say that. Uh, but in terms of more broadly, you know, from a sign language um, user's perspective, in, in the Irish context, Irish sign language was only legally recognised in 2017. And that legislation only formally commenced in 2020. And in 20, today I was preparing, Stephen, I was being good decision, <laughs> um, but I had a look at, there was this report published in December 2021 on the operationalization of the Irish Sign Language Act by the National Disability Authority. I have a problem that it was the National Disability Authority who were asked to do this because it's about a language, not about disability. Mm -hmm. um, but they found that the majority of public services didn't even know that there was an Irish Sign Language Act. Um, and so if you don't know, how are you supposed to respond to that? You know, compare that with in other contexts, like in, in Scotland, there's a British Sign Language Act there, and they have brilliant action plans in place. They have joined up thinking, and they then have to report on their progress with respect to those actions. We don't have anything like that here. So we see very ad hoc responses. So even while, you know, so even within the deaf community, we all have um, deaf people coming to Ireland from other places. They use sign language. So Irish sign language is the sign language used in Ireland. It's got no relationship to Gaelga, to, to Irish. But on the island of Ireland, we also have British sign language used in Northern Ireland alongside Irish sign language. And we have small communities of Polish deaf people, Latvian deaf people, Ukrainian deaf people, uh, particularly, you know, in the past year or so. So how do we respond to multilingualism that's also multimodal? I think that's a big question for us. And it's not one that we have been addressing at this stage to date. Oh. Well, I guess that's going to kill the live stream. <laughs> that's something I said. No. <laughs> <laughs> Just time to digest. Yes, exactly. Okay, sorry about the uh, the No, no, I was trying to. Uh, Lorraine, were you? 
were you going to make a, a further point there before my boneheaded interruption? That's fine then. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I, I think my work is not like the, the impact is probably quite different um, in terms of my work. So, um, of course, uh, we have a lot of uh, multilingual students uh, or students who speak different languages at the university. And um, that is always something that we're aware of and that we have to deal with. But I don't really see it as a massive challenge. Um, I think it's more uh, something that uh, we have to take into account when we're grading them, when we're putting out assignments, when we're developing assignments. And my interest would be more in terms of uh, validating that or in in sense of bringing that into the space so that everybody can profit from uh, the multilinguality and that becomes aware of the fact that spaces are not monolingual or no space probably is monolingual anymore. Now with Stephen together we've been looking a little bit about how the global university deals with that. I mean the UCD as the global university in, uh, in Ireland uh, is obviously thinking uh, is is promoting uh, global uh, globalness, but we haven't really seen what that means in terms of language. It seems to be a non-language global behavior or something that is uh, just English, because and that that's one of the things that we've been trying to look at is you know how can how can like how do people who work here how can how do they feel about for example, having to do pretty much everything through English or other spaces where they can do things through other languages, and would they like to have more done things done um, through other languages and, and or other spaces where they already do it, and how can we promote that, for example? That's uh, one of the things, and I think uh, that's something also to bring back to um, the population as general, that probably most people speak different languages and they should be comfortable to bring that into the public space and into the education space. Um, the other area where I see it in my research, I literally, I don't think I've ever done research where I can just do it in one language because there's always other things to read in another language, uh, people to talk to through other languages and I have to extend my own linguistic um, uh, abilities or competencies in lots of different ways, or I have to find people who can bridge certain kinds of things. So that's, I think that's the kind of thing that's uh, relevant for me. But I've also noticed, for example, that there is a lot of interest in multilinguality, but a lot of people can't really see how that could work out. And uh, I was talking to Lorraine just at the beginning that I always have a section in one of my undergraduate first year classes about sign language, for example, and a lot of the students find that really liberating and they find that really interesting that there's a story and a lot of them then want to do something so we can see that there is interest. But I don't think this is really brought to any level that most of the time it's 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 kind of it's there, but we're not talking about it or we're not bringing it up. And I was uh, saying to sometimes I, is to to make this clear to some of my students um, when in, in a lot of places on the continent uh, of Europe nowadays, if you just fell into English and like say you did something in German and then suddenly you continued in English, most people wouldn't really find that strange anymore and they would accept that. If we did, the, if I started speaking German or whatever in the middle of a lecture or a presentation, people would probably bring me away to a place to be treated. <laughs> so, and I think that is something that we really have to think about as something that is. It's sustained very strongly um, and, and, and very strongly felt as th this hasn't really happened in Ireland, where the, 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 there is development in that area that we need. Uh, Francesca Lamorgi is co founder of Mother Tongues Ireland. Um, I apologize for not introducing her earlier. <laughs> um, Francesca, would you like to make a, a few points about how your work is influenced by and motivated by? Uh, multilingualism in Ireland? Yeah, I suppose my, I, I have two heads, two hats, <laughs> maybe just one head. Um, and part of my work has been the academic work 
but that has always focused on children and children as they develop using more than one language and the other part is what you're describing as you know the work with mother tongues has been broader um and i think it's it's been really interesting for me to work for many years like 20 years in the university context and then stepping into the real world if you want to call it that way so a world where um we have to respond to the needs of the population on a daily basis without having our own agenda i suppose so at the very beginning it was very much a piece of work in the community to find out what people know about bilingualism what people need especially what parents need um and something that i found very interesting is that um sometimes the research shows this but it's also really interesting to hear people tell you that they feel very lonely when they're raising children and speaking more than one language in ireland no matter where they are they could be in the middle of the city center of dublin or cork they could be living in the midlands they could be living in urban or suburban uh, rural areas but there's always that feeling of i'm doing this on my own and this also applies to irish speakers very often which people might also find surprising because you might think yes as an italian parent i always felt okay who's going to help me to speak italian to my children it, it, is it just going to be me uh, maybe making mistakes along the way or whatever. Uh, but I find that no matter what community support is available, parents really find this challenging. And at the same time, I feel that we've come a long way in this area, not only in the research, but also in terms of the knowledge that professionals have developed over the years. Because one of the key worries that mother tongues have always had and I always, always had was, well, if a parent goes out into the world, who could they ask information about bilingualism, about how, you know, what's the best strategy, even very simple questions, you don't know where to turn. And that's why Mother Tongues was created. Uh, but the people that are primarily meeting the parents, maybe a GP, maybe your early childhood educator, or crash teachers or primary school teachers, you're going to encounter a professional that very often you're going to trust. So what I feel has been very important in the last few years and is definitely incredibly improved over the last few years is the awareness and the training of all these professionals that come in regular contact with parents and with children, which is also really important. And they have to not only validate the experience of growing up speaking more than one language, which is definitely not the same as growing up with a single language, but they also have to respond to sometimes worries and concerns uh, that parents have. So I feel my my big challenge is, uh, and I, I link in what, with, with, what, with what Bettina was saying a moment ago, is that if we come at this with a very monolingual mindset, we're always going to see bilingualism as a challenge or a difficulty or a problem when actually here we are discussing something that is enriching everyone's life and all the challenges we might find along our way are challenges that if they get solved or addressed, they're gonna benefit everybody in the community and not only bilingual or multilingual people. So I think one of our, uh, our, our key sort of uh, talking point so far is about access and how do multilinguals, people who use languages other than um, the official languages in Ireland, how do they access information? How do they get to, you know, sometimes life-saving information? This is something, Lorraine, you've written about recently. Yeah, we're just finishing up a really interesting project actually that we've worked on with the Dublin Rape Crisis Centre and the European Union of the Deaf and a number of other partners, including uh, the University of Vigo and Harriet Watt University in Scotland um, and Interresource Group Ireland, where our, our chair. And what we wanted to do was we wanted to look at evidence-informed approaches to how service providers respond to predominantly women and girls who've experienced domestic sexual and gender violence. And, you know, 
what we find is there's so little information available in languages um, other than English. Um, if you're deaf, there are very few service providers who provide any information in a sign language. Um, if you want to find a helpline, even through COVID, you know, we had this huge increase in um, prevalence of reporting of domestic abuse. They had a wonderful campaign in English on the TV with a phone number that you could ring. So what happens if you don't know English? What happens if you don't speak, if you can't use a phone? Um, or even if you're a speaker of another language where your, your English language skills are only commencing, you're a new speaker. Well, then how do you have the competence and proficiency and confidence to engage in those ways. So, so that's a big problem. There's also there's another brilliant report actually that was written during COVID um, by colleagues in DCU looking at translation and trust in Ireland's response to the pandemic. It's open access, it's available on their site. But they also talked about their how hit and miss the response to providing information about COVID even was across the range of languages. That while there were some languages that are very well represented. There were others that just weren't, or you get a thin slither. You know, people used to say to me, Isn't it amazing to see the Irish Sign Language interpreters on every night for the briefing? And I'd say, Yeah, for 20 minutes every day. But what happens in the other 23 and a half hours? Where are deaf people supposed to get reliable information from? Because it's not available in a language other than English. So, you know, there are issues, but they these issues are across the system. You know, we do see some really good examples of good practice. So we've got um, the um, Women's Aid have worked with the National Deaf Women's Group for a long time in terms of ensuring that they have Irish Sign Language information on their sites. Um, but I had a student doing her undergraduate in Deaf Studies last year who looked at access to information about abortion care. And just looking at really simple things as an accessibility audit on the websites and found that the majority, including the HFE, do not have anything other than a phone number that you can call if you want to make an appointment for certain things. So, so you know, there's again this big disconnect between obligations under um, legislation like uh, the public sector duty or the Irish Sign Language Act. Um, and what actually is happening in practice. So, so you know, we could go on and on. There, we've also been doing quite a lot of work with the Gardaí here in Ireland. So um, if you go on and have a look at the moment and you want to find information about the victim's directive mm -hmm. in, in, in Ireland, you know, and how that's applied here, you can get that in many languages, probably about 20, 25 languages. There's nothing yet in Irish Sign Language, but we have recorded that over the summer for them. Um, an Irish Sign Language translation. And we have actually also, um, it's taken probably about eight years to get to this point, but we have permission to move forward with the implementation of an Irish Sign Language version of the Garda Caution, mm -hmm. the Garda Caution, um, because that wasn't available yet. So there's a whole ton of work that's gone on behind the scenes in terms of you know the research piece, the, the talking with community piece, the engaging with the DPP, the, the Garda legal people have been really, really supportive. But, you know, every step that we take seems to shine a light on the many, many places where access is denied. And that means that your, your rights as a citizen, as a, a person living in this country are denied. So, you know, how do we make sure that that changes that, you know, when we talked about COVID, we talked about building back better we talked about we're all in this together like oh no we're not you know oh no we're not and particularly not when you look at it through the lens of multilingualism yeah well you know the biggest challenge that uh, we have in our community is access and uh, when you look into a person that is coming and is Back in a system called direct provision. When you are in, 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 in towns or cities where you have got access to uh, the, the, the facilities uh, and colleges, uh, it, it's, it's easy for a person to be able to get that information. And we also do help when there is information that is available. Uh, like uh, the re most recent one is, is an offer from, from, from Trinity for free English classes for, for people in our community. But the other challenge is that you don't have control 
of where you're going to be placed. You can be placed in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and I have been to this, to this, to this center. There is, there is a center in, uh, in off the mountains and all that. No connectivity. And uh, you want to integrate within the state. And the language is a barrier in terms of this integration that you want to promote. And uh, more than that, that person doesn't have the resources, the connectivity, if you have to do things online. So those are the, those are the big challenges that we face in terms of the access. Even if there is something that is available, which is very, very rare because the, the, the attitude uh, uh, from the powers that be is, is, is not to give the support to the people that seek protection at the time that they need. It is just the attitude from, from day one. I was in the system for four, for four years. I know exactly what, what happens in terms of not getting that. It's what, I mean, in, in, in people like myself, for instance, I could not have an issue with regard to communication. But if it's somebody that is coming all the way from Somalia doesn't have a word of English, a word of English, and is placed somewhere in in in, in Monaghan, in in, in 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 the middle of nowhere, there is no way that that person can be able to access information and integrate, uh, and and do whatever the person can 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 start. I was speaking to a family a, a few months ago from Syria who there was a pharmacist in that family and a doctor, but their issue was the language and they qualified their issue to progress was the language. And it's very strict here in Ireland in terms of you incorporate your own kind of uh, qualifications and it's worse when you don't understand English at all. So it's a big, big uh, challenge uh, with, uh, with with access, and it is a hindrance to progression. Uh, yeah, that is just from the, from my community that I I uh, you know so now. Yeah. yeah, I would say um, <clears throat> it's probably the same it, when you think about a university context where everything is provided in English and the assumption is you can just uh, get it all through English and if you come here as a student then you must have passed your IELTS and so you must be at the right level and you can just understand it um, and the same thing you know UCD is bringing in more and more staff uh, from many different countries to show its diversity but that doesn't mean that um, the, the linguistic issues being facilitated, basically you're thrown in and you learn. Now, <clears throat> you could argue that uh, somebody who has an academic degree uh, should be able to handle that, but not all academic degrees or all people are equally uh, well set up for that. Now, I think what makes things better uh, for people here a lot of times is that you build up these networks, right? So I know so many Spanish people who can then explain to me, or I live uh, at work, I have another a person who comes from another country and they know this is always going to be a major problem. So uh, when you're starting, think about that. So there is this kind of handing on information um, in a way uh, as a network exercise and uh, some of the interviews that Stephen and I and uh, Tobias have been doing as well they show that actually um, also some of the staff in units um, the, the administrative staff who increasingly also come from different language backgrounds actively use their language competence in order to deal with students from similar backgrounds but there, there is no recognition within uh, the unit that that's happening, or there are no credits for that, uh, or the competency is not uh, positively registered. 
And increasingly we see, which I think is a good idea, if we have a lot of students from one particular background, a particular national or whatever background, that we also hire staff from the background. But then it doesn't seem that people get any credit for it or that there is any checking of all, uh, like, you know, whatever. We have a lot of Indian students, uh, but India is not like a homogenous state. So you can't just, uh, you have to think about how, how do you deal with that? So for me, um, there is this kind of blanket thing, blanket assumptions, and there is no, well, there's somehow a, a struggle on, and for students as well, this is why they've come here, to learn to, to do things in English. And yes, I agree, when you go abroad, you have to learn to struggle through some of these things, you know, but um, the question is, how much and how much can you make it difficult or easier for people? But yeah, the validation, I think, is of what a lot of people are also complaining about, that they feel that they are doing all this additional work, but they're not enumerated necessarily, but it's something along those lines. Francesca, you're uh, working with young people long before they're at university. Uh, early, early years in primary school, do you see the same sorts of issues around um, access for, for, for users of languages other than English or Irish? Well, one of the unsurmountable challenges <laughs> and typical questions we got even this week has to do with speech and language therapy and with the assessment of language difficulties or the assessment of learning difficulties, because um, while it seems that, say, parents who come from maybe they they, they may be new to Ireland uh, they have an expectation that there'd be education so they they do navigate the access to free early childhood hours and primary school um, but what we find is that there is a huge concern in these communities of multilingual families around the time when children are between three and six uh, that have to do with language delay uh, or maybe a mismatch <laughs> between what the parents expect the children's English is going to be versus what uh, children develop. Um, and there is quite a large number of queries that come our way, uh, especially around the fact that parents would like to have speech and language therapists who are either openly uh, knowledgeable about bilingualism and obviously we don't provide lists or we don't endorse professionals in various uh, you know in in any area but also people would like to have therapy that acknowledges the child's knowledge in all of the languages and that is currently not possible unless what some communities do is that they go to speech and language therapists who have trained in the country of Ireland, say in Poland. So they live in Ireland, they can work in Ireland, and they are aware of assessment for, for Polish monolinguals and for English monolinguals. And they kind of, they can give a broader overview. I think that's a real problem because in, in lack, with the lack of expertise of the lack of tools to assess bilinguals, it's very difficult sometimes to tell if a child has a real problem or if the child is simply developing English for the first time. So it takes some time to get to the same milestones, for example. So we find that that is a real issue in, in the Irish context. In, in all over Europe, we know it's an issue. It's not simply an Irish problem, but given the number of, like the increasing number of children growing up with two or more languages, it is something that would need to be addressed even at the level of training of speech and language therapists and even sharing information about concerns and worries in this area. So I feel that's that's an access problem we have. Just adding on that, because you prompted me to, to also reflect on the fact that for deaf kids, the majority of their parents are hearing people who have never encountered a deaf person before. And so trying to ensure that deaf kids aren't medicalized and that the assumption is they'll just have a cochlear implant and therefore they'll be a hearing person yeah. um, but rather that they're also duly 
uh, given access to Irish Sign Language or another sign language, um, and that we make sure that we're putting in place pathways to ensure that they don't experience language deprivation, which is a really, really significant problem here in Ireland, but also around the world. So, so that is something that we encounter. And then equally, you know, when we have other newcomers to Ireland with children who are deaf, very often those children are presenting without access to any sign language or any spoken language. So there are severe language delays all around. So there, there are, you know, all of these um, layers of, of challenge then that need to be unpacked and making sure that the system can ensure that there are appropriate supports provided by the right people, you know, and very often to me that means having good trained deaf people uh, who can step into these spaces where they have too been marginalised today. So there's a, an issue there of ensuring that deaf people have access to training to become, for example, a language therapist or to be a teacher in mainstream schools, things that they're not currently allowed to do. So well, basically what I'm hearing then is that grassroots activities are really the only way to go. And that's what we find even when you were talking about the translation of websites and so on. If you notice a problem, then you should go and fix it because if you wait for somebody else to come, and I think that's the only way all the information and bilingual information and so on come about. And I'm, I'm glad that there is more work being done, but... I think it's all a grassroots initiative uh, nowadays, and I think we all need to get involved in that. In the same way that Francesca was saying, I mean, the information, if if you notice that there are a lot of whatever uh, Polish-English bilinguals, um, well, then nearly uh, what we need to bring that up to people who are working in um in, in speech and language therapy to start doing research on that particular so that they can build up the developmental um milestones and things like that but it's only that way that it works right and it's yeah. probably not unique to ireland that's for sure but we need to have more linkage in that way yeah, yeah no, no i fully agree with, with, with that and uh, if it were not for the work of the grassroots we would wouldn't be where at least we are uh, mm -hmm. as, as marginalized groups of people and uh, if if we can all focus on that and uh, yeah i was talking to doubt is is one of the leaders in the somalian community and uh, we have developed a a, a a booklet an information booklet uh, uh, from ourselves, and uh, it's in English, and we want to 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 be friendly to the other communities. And uh, he is gonna now translate that into their language, so that when we talk, uh, they understand. And uh, uh, and uh, it's a way to go. And there's no funds for that. It's just people just doing the work. Mm -hmm. Which they love to do, and uh, it is those results. Because at the end, there must be those results. Yeah, agree with that. Francesca, this is probably one of those rare times when wearing two hats is actually quite fashionable because you get to do the grassroots that links your research, correct? Yeah, and as as I was hearing your comments earlier, I was thinking there is a really big difference. <laughs> between the two because when you're doing research you are definitely very often in this area addressing real world problems which is great uh, but when you're working in an organization uh, it could be you know i, I probably think um lucky might agree with me you're always in at the deep end you're always under pressure trying to serve everybody as quickly as possible as efficiently as possible and there isn't enough manpower to actually get the work done because you don't have government funding, you don't have the resources. So I think that's the biggest difference between doing research with funding, with a maybe a full-time job and a university that kind of supports you versus having to not only kind of run an organization, but also being the port of call 
for individuals to come to you. So it's fascinating, but it's it, it could slowly kill you as well, I think. <laughs> in a because it's a very intense and very emotional work as well. Are there ways for us to link in better with communities, you think, as an academic community to make real inroads? I mean, your work for years and years eventually found the right ears uh, in, in Senator Daly. Um, is that it? Do you just knock on doors until you eventually find the right one, do the right research? have the right time, I mean, it's... Part of it is certainly about the power of one-on-one -on -one conversation and the building relationships over time and then trusting that there will be other people who will have those conversations. So you get a snowball effect. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, that's where COVID helped. It was in terms of visibility brought conversation, which brought interest. And, you know, we can certainly and should, must, um, build forward on that. So, so I, I do think there's something there. I think it's also about, you know, it's about effort. You've talked about this, Lucky, you know, and, and Francesca just talked about that too. It's, it's about, you know, who has to do the heavy lifting? And one of the problems is that so often it is the people who are most marginalized, who are most overwhelmed with having to deal with systems, who are maybe victims of crime or, you know, struggling financially, who have to figure out how to make the system do what the system should be doing automatically. And that's not right. So I think that as academics, we have a duty of care where we can to be working with those. I think I'm, I'm fortunate. I came from working in NGOs into academia. I've always been an interpreter. I've always worked with deaf communities. So I feel that I have a foot in, in each camp. And I think that that keeps it real for me because um, you know, deaf people, uh, we'll tell it how it is, that's right and proper. But in terms of ways of doing it better, um, I've been involved in a project that I never thought I'd be involved in a project like this, which is looking at machine translation on sign language. Um, and one of the things I really admire about the AI colleagues who we've worked with has been how committed and open they've been to co-creation principles. And we embedded that from before we started to prepare the application through the project, having iterative cycles of engagement with communities across Europe, deaf communities, but also making sure that we had deaf academics and deaf organizations as key partners leading out on aspects of the project. So I think that that has been a real model for how things can be done. And I think that that's a very powerful way of really embedding and mainstreaming potential for change. But it's slow. I mean, I think if you want something to, to last and be meaningful, you have to be willing to take the slow road because sometimes when things happen very quickly, they're not sustained and they're not sustainable. I think would be my initial thoughts. Yeah, I think I think as well that uh, there is there is room for the academia in terms of uh, getting involved uh, from the grassroots and but, but importantly is 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 the understanding of the needs uh, and, and the attitude to a togetherness kind of attitude. It's, it, it, there's a question I like so much is that what can we do together? If, if you, you don't need to be coming with a, in a kind of imposing kind of attitude, but it's, 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 it must be a balanced kind of approach whereby that individ those individuals feel part of the process. Uh, once you understand that, because if you, if you just try to balance the level that you're coming from the academia side and just forget that part, just for a while, just forget that part and be with the sufferers. And you will find a, a, a win-win, a workable solutions together. And that's why I'm saying there is room for everybody to, to be getting involved. And, and these are the kinds of talks that can, uh, you know, spearhead that type of, uh, of, of just the attitude and the appetite for the other people who, who 
some or to look aside or look one way and not see the other problems that are there that they can be able to use their skills, use their experience to try and, and help on the other side to get things done. That, that, that's my view. Um, I, I do a lot of research in uh, South America on a language uh, that's all also quite minoritized, both in the French overseas department and in the independent country of Suriname. And I, I mean, my okay, my main interest brought me there because I'm doing research on the language and so on. But I find myself for the last 25 years doing all kinds of things from uh, kind of you know translating things pre-translating because one thing, for example, that I've noticed, especially. Uh, people who maybe it's also culturally not the main thing that people flock to writing and reading and but uh, there is an understanding that more stuff needs to be brought into the written space um, but I see that people kind of don't feel very happy writing mm -hmm. and so on and so forth so what I've done sometimes to even progress things I spend my evenings not all the time, but spend my evenings translating or putting things into the language and then say to them, hey, I've given it a try. Can you make it can you make it so that it sounds like it comes from you and not from me? <laughs> you know, and those kinds of things. And you know, initially I was always kind of uh, as a academic code kind of tells you not to do that, right? But I found that uh, people are actually quite appreciative because there are often, once there's something there, people are happy to work on it. And so we have, we've often done these kinds of things from very basic things from the, for the, for a school project, they needed kind of a dictionary. And I, I mean, I could see that they have so many other things going on in their lives and they're not linguists. So I kind of, uh, took the forward bit and basically saw what work needed to be done and distributed to people, took it back, uh, looked at the issues, uh, did you just do this, that, and the other, and then wrote the text that needed to come with it to explain what's going on. Because basically uh, the funder was saying, oh yeah, the dictionary is now here, just throw it at people without any text to explain it. But, you know, I thought, well, it should be really there in, in a number of different languages because we don't know which language people can read and write. And so, you know, so I, uh, so I, I found myself of doing these kinds of things and then uh, sitting down and okay should we change this to that or and all those kinds of things and I think that's one of the things that you should be prepared to do and this is the grassroots thing I'm talking about so you can't just do this hey I'm the linguist I'll, I'll, I'll look that the lexical entry looks okay and the, the text form no you have to actually get involved into the the very basic thing um that's one thing, but I think I can also use my academic skills in a way that, uh, and I've often seen that where I see that people locally might not see it as a problem, but I can see in the long run, this is going to turn into a problem. Mm -hmm. So I basically alert people to issues and kind of help them together with them to find a way in which we can forecast and get start working on it again, where I might make a suggestion, they look at it and they don't like it, and then they say maybe this way or that way. And the big thing is it's the slowness can sometimes kill you, mm -hmm. um, but you just have to accept that people have lots of different things in their lives and that as academics, I can carve a bit of time out and say, hey, I'm just going to do this now this afternoon and the other thing will just have to wait or something, which sometimes you can't do or other people can't do. So, um, you know, so it's, it's this, you know, give and take and give and take and uh, to be willing to basically put your uh, abilities at the service, push ahead, but say to people, well, hey, but you should check what I'm doing. And thereby also, and that's one of the things I like. I've noticed that it, I have over the years seen that people have become more confident in doing things themselves now because I've mm -hmm. kind of charted the path a bit for them and say, look, this is how simple it is. Just get going on it and see what happens. And uh, because I think a lot of times people can see uh, if they are in a, in a vulnerable position, how you can get to this, but I can, you know, or I have the confidence to say, hey, we just 
do this now and see what happens, mm -hmm. you know. So it's it's so you can use your ability to do things. Um, you, the things that you've learned uh, by engaging and also showing people that you make mistakes and I've noticed people like to correct your mistakes as well so that's a good one as well to give people confidence so it's it's that it's that uh, give and go and being willing to engage and not always say hey my hour is now over and oh uh, I'm only working until five uh, or you know stepping outside of the limit but I have always found that I've learned a lot that way from my research, for example, as well, where the discussions have sometimes revealed things where, where maybe I had thought about it for weeks, where and I just couldn't figure out why this was going on. And after talking about it for some other purpose, I discovered some, or I discovered that, oh yeah, there are things actually that we should be researching, like what you were saying, well, if this is needed, the uh, how do bilinguals, do this then you know that's a good thing i can maybe sell that off as student projects and things like that you know i think you know just building on that, i love that example um and remind me to tell you later on about a friend of mine who's worked on Suriname Sign Language. Okay. <laughs> but I, I think that one of the things that we can do, there's these challenges when you're in academia where there are expectations, particularly I think if you're an early career researcher. Yes. And you're thinking about, you know, what are the milestones I have to hit in order to be promoted, in order to get tenure, in order to be, um, you know, deemed a, an appropriate academic within an institutional setting. And that can sometimes rub up against what you really, really want to do for the community. So I think academia has a lot of reflection to do in terms of thinking about, you know, if we're asking people to report on um, service to the community, service to discipline, um, engagement with communities, well, then we need to not see those as siloed things separate from research. I think we need to see them more holistically. So I think that's a, a sectoral institutional thing to, to be thinking about. But in, in terms of, you know, the, the the kinds of work that can really be very meaningful and grow change and grow confidence in communities. During COVID, myself and my colleagues at the Centre for Deaf Studies offered training to a bunch of 24 deaf people who trained as sign language interpreters. Mm -hmm. And they were going to work between sign languages and across different modalities, including for people who are deaf blind. So that would include thinking about haptic communication and other things. But of course, we had to do it online, which was very challenging. <laughs> but one of the things that we did do was we linked up with the Houses of the Oireachtas. And we also linked in with our own project, the Justice Science Project, looking at gender-based violence. And we thought about you know, the, the gaps in the lexicon that existed in those domains. And another colleague in DCU has been looking at STEM and STEM glossary terms. So we spent time with these deaf interpreters figuring out, you know, well, what would a sign be for trafficking in Irish sign language? There's no term. What about course of control? What about going to court? Like, you know, and working our way through them. And we created and generated a first draft vocabulary where we had time to think about what do these terms mean? If you're going to be interpreting, what does that mean? Um, how do they fit together? You know, what are the legal implications of certain things? And then we brought them to the community more broadly and invited engagement. And then we had a smaller group of people who signed off on what would be, and we understand it to be, the glossary that would be used for now. So we had a great opportunity to talk about language change, um, new terms, um, you know, the different kinds of, of settings and how language might be used differently in those or with different groups of people for different purposes. And it was a really rewarding process. So we're about to go live with some of those glossaries very shortly, but we know that they're going to be valuable. Mm -hmm. And we know that they're also going to be useful in terms of teaching Irish sign language and for people who are engaging with the system in the deaf community. So, you know, I think that these are, are things that we can do. We can think about what's the multi-purpose nature of the work that we're doing from an academic standpoint but also in terms of what communities want and say that they want and find ways of joining lines between them. Absolutely. Um, I suppose maybe a final question for me before we turn it over to uh, questions from the audience. Uh, and maybe we'll start with Francesca, just to uh, keep things <laughs> balanced. Um, if there is a, is there a path towards a more inclusive Ireland? purely from our bailiwick, which is language, uh, that we can 
help, you know, at least buy the paper to make the maps. What, what will be a good first step for researchers to join up uh, with grassroots organizations? And does that have policy implications? Okay. I like more the second part because the first question is so big. I said I'd never going to be able to answer a question like that. Um, no, I think it's all like you're saying, it's all steps. So, of course, there is a path and it, there isn't a set path. It's all about trying uh, various different ways. Uh, I think it, this is based on my experience and it's my personal opinion. Um, what really I find difficult to deal with is sometimes the fact that language is so key to everything, you know, uh, well, Lorraine has spoken about it. it. It's just so needed. It's just such a huge part of our identity, of our lives, of our heritage, of the next generation, but we don't talk about it. So our conversations about language tend to stay in our circles. And even though there are international celebrations, I've seen events all over Ireland, even in libraries, it's still very, very limited considering how important language is. So I think this is a the first step, maybe, in my opinion, going really from the very beginning is to collectively raise awareness of how important every language is. English, no doubt, you know, English to access services, English to communicate, to socialize, to feel part of something. You know, I've, I always feel if I, whenever I really managed to speak English a little bit better, and I mean more in an Irish way, I suppose, I felt that I was a little bit more part of the people around me, my neighborhood, my friends, my own children, who now are, you know, Irish. Um, but it, it's still, you know, even when we talk about multilingualism, it seems to be a problem of the other. When we talk about languages that are not English, it's like it's a problem of some people and not everybody. So maybe something that we can do collectively is to address this monolingual mindset and this lack of awareness of how important language is full stop for everything when you wake up in the morning language is important uh, so how you feel about yourself as a speaker of english is important for you as an individual how you speak at a job interview is important you know everything we do everything we feel is linked to language so i think this is the first step and then there's a very long way as well to, to go in so many areas of life not just uh language sociolinguistics it's really really broad but everybody should be brought it should be brought to everyone's attention that our mindset is very english focused and we need to broaden that Yeah. Um, well, if you look into what we have, the gap that we have identified since we started this chat earlier, uh, you can see that there is a, a way, there is a path there to 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 for for this awareness. I agree with Francesca there, uh, and to me also is is about. From the from the children's side of things, and it's important that it is instilled at that level at that age, if you wanna carry on with this. And all languages are important, and it's very important as well. Even if a person is coming as a foreigner here, learning the foreign language, but not really moving away from their own kind of culture, from their own kind of of language, you'll find some some in, in families, for instance, who children end up not speaking their their native uh, language, and they are speaking the foreign language, and they they it's like their language now becomes foreign language, 
and and uh, and that is it needs to get back there. But at least at home, let's speak our native language. Uh, we when we go out and, and speak in school and and, and, and etc then you can speak the language that you can learn because that's where you lose you lose the value you lose the the, 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 the culture for instance nobody speak no child speak Irish language you know uh if you tell it is at school but it's 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 it's, it's, it's you know it's going down I would say uh because of, of the fact that it's people want to do a quick quick thing so that you can be able to know that language and carry on but the value of the culture has to be you know upheld so that when we do as you, as you talk about these these gatherings that you'll have the uh, multicultural multicultural events but some people find themselves with no culture <laughs> <laughs> You know, so because culture and language they goes together. I mean, it's, you're hitting on an uh, interesting point there because I think the celebration is always about the global, the multi, and while I think it's important to to do that, um, it can be quite threatening. For, for some people or in, in, in some contexts. And I think often people don't realize how threatening it can be for so, from certain perspectives. So I think that's that's definitely uh, very important. But yeah, to I think to raise awareness about the fact that life can be done through more than one language, it can be done through other language. I mean, one thing that I often find uh, quite interesting, I've kind of realized in recent years that Actually, I think there's a lot of people who think that actually true learning only happens through English. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm always kind of flabbergasted about that uh, because I think there, are, there that is quite... So like a, a good degree will be done through English, a good thing. And I think that's becoming quite quite a common perspective nowadays. And it, I, I actually find that a bit... I was a bit shocked when I started finding out that there are a lot of people who are thinking like that, because it really means that a lot of places and uh, cultures or whatever are being devalued or, and, and I mean, especially in the place where I do research, especially when I research uh, from the French side, I'm, I'm constantly being told that people need to, I need to know French to access the world. And it's like, hey, do you think that there's no other access to the world outside of French, you know? And, you know, I, I obviously uh, always laugh about this kind of French position, but it's, I've kind of learned to understand that this position is very strong here too, right? That people feel that the real learning is through English. It's just not articulated in such an aggressive form, an overt form as it is in France, where you can attack it basically. Here it's very hard to attack, you know, because it's just the, the common position. So, yeah, I think that's important uh, to th th this kind of understanding that everything can be done in different, through different languages and means. That leads me to, it reminds me of the. <laughs> The language which uh, was forced in, in 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 the olden days in South Africa yeah. that led to the riots of of of, of seventy six of forcing oh, forcing Africans language yes. students rise up against that yes to say no yes. To that. yes and it's I, I speak Tosa Zulu English yes he learned some Africans. Obviously, with a bad attitude on it. Yes. So uh, it's it's something that we just refused to yeah. to, to be taught in Africans, yeah. let alone learning the language. So you, you it, it just right. Yeah. It can't be that yeah. one language dominating and, us. And and I mean, there is this big European perspective that only through European languages you can learn something because African yeah. language is an important yeah. So th this is there, but we see it at the upper end of the hierarchy. And I think 
I think a lot of, for a long time, people didn't think about it, but I think especially around English, it has risen. And we do know, I mean, we were just talking about that, that a lot of our graduate students turn up here because they know that buying English for their degree, through their degree, is something that will get them better jobs and things like that. You know, which, you know, if they see it as one thing, that's fine. But if then the attitude comes, which I then see you uh, starting to develop from that, that only through English is a way to access knowledge, mm -hmm. then that becomes difficult. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's it's good for to, to make the students, but everybody to explore the fact that you can do perfectly well through lots of different languages. Mm -hmm. And you might not always come back with the exact same view of the word, but that's also the, in the design, because not all worlds can be the same. And that is to be valued, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. I love, um, I have loads of thoughts going around in my head right now, but one of the thoughts that has been percolating through this conversation is the, the work of Tovis Kutlap Kangas, mm -hmm. who uh, did so much work on talking about language rights or human rights. Yes. And she would talk about the fact that when the UN Convention was initially conceived, there was an article proposed on the protection of language rights. It didn't make it through in the final yeah. version, but it doesn't mean that that wasn't part and parcel of that conversation. What? How many years ago now? How many decades yeah. ago? And I think that that's something we need to bring out again. So I think that that's something that's important for us in the, the ongoing conversation. And the, the other thing that I think is really interesting uh, at the moment is there's in, in many universities this conversation around decolonizing curriculum. Yes. <laughs> and you know when you were speaking there, Bettina, it really struck me that. Um, you know, while we're looking at making sure that in our curricula that we're not presenting a homogenized, westernized view of academia, that what we really also need to do is make sure that the, 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 the decolonized curriculum isn't still just an English-centric <laughs> curriculum, that we make sure that we're looking at other um, ways of, of expressing Absolutely. academic uh, visions of the world yeah. and you know linked to that I have a lovely example I've got great colleagues in Brazil where they've done amazing work there to develop an academic um, uh, approach to working with deaf communities mm. and they have made it possible for deaf people to do PhDs in Libras which is Brazilian sign language mm -hmm. and so they have deaf they have probably the largest number of deaf PhDs in the world, I would say at this point, and it was because of very intentional interventions. Mm -hmm. I think when you look at where, you know, for any equality piece of work, where we see outcomes, it's where people have made intentional interventions and where they focus on and they insist upon reporting over time. So I think if we want to have meaningful change in this space, we're going to have to do that same kind of work. Yes. They're my thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, I just want to take a moment to thank the panel uh, for everyone being very generous with your time uh, and also uh, our, our gathered audiences uh, for also uh, suffering through this uh, warm, humid mm -hmm. September evening. Um, do we have questions maybe for the room? And if anybody's online wants to put a, a question into the chat, feel free. Yeah, I mean, thank you so much for this wonderful round table. And I don't really have that much to add. Um, but I really, what struck me is, you know, I'm I'm in the university setting. I'm in the School of Languages. We teach yes. what French, German, Italian, Spanish, Portuguese as well. Mm -hmm. And these are main languages. But there's, I'm wondering how we can teach them because, you know, there's also the question of trying to involve minority languages or less you know, major languages, other ways, which come with a whole load of difficulties and practical ones as well. But there's something else thing about how we teach them, because it seems to me a lot of the time it's like, oh, this one is spoken in X number of countries, and that, etc. That means that you can do this, you can use the language. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if there's more that we could do in terms of, well, you can use this language so you can help others, you know? Mm -hmm. This idea of this language, what you can use it for the help of others and whether we 
shift our thinking and how we talk about that with our students or how we try to get them to think about a different way, a different perspective of it. And mm -hmm. I just, it's not really a question, it's just something I really like to put out there. I mean, it is something that's actually discussed to a certain extent, these notions of multi the multilingual space or um, university. So some people um, like Solar have argued, and it's kind of promoted a little bit at the at, at some UK universities in a, in a uh, idea that instead, rather than just go to for, for these what you call global languages or globalized languages, um, we should look at okay. Dublin, what kinds of languages play an important role here? How can we bring them um, uh, closer to, uh, to into the space to the students, so to use the university also as a space in order for uh, people from from the different background, like to be representative of the people that are participating in that, and to and in a way also to to get uh, intercultural comprehension. Uh, promoted and um it's a, i think it's a very good idea that we shouldn't just as you say teach people languages that bring you far away but uh, also to understand the local context mm -hmm. um and so i don't actually i've been meaning to check i, I know a few years ago i've been working a bit with the I, i've been working a bit with the polish embassy and so we insisted on having polish in the um, applied language center because we felt like look there's a lot of polish people living in this country a lot of children going through the school who have lots of different knowledge of they might be speakers but not writing whatever if we offer it as something maybe even just at the applied language center for now so that it is becoming visible then that's good and we actually found somebody and with the help of somebody we had there who knew uh, uh polish but also uh, some of the technological stuff th there was a whole curriculum set up i think for first and second level and um i think it ran for quite a bit and i think it still runs and there was interest uh, in that and you know we've been thinking about well if this is an interesting thing maybe we can go further same thing with sign language because there was this complaint that well why don't we like if, if edi is so important then in any case yeah, I mean, I've been complaining about this up and down to the EDI university. Why is language not part of it? But I, I'm just get being rebuffed, you know. Um, but sign language, actually, it was, again, a grassroots initiative where the people in the Applied Language Center said, we want it here. We want these kinds of things here. So it was pushed, made available, and I think it's very popular, and people take it as electives. And the other thing that a lot of staff are still complaining about, for example, is that you know you might be from uh, you might be from Poland and never had the possibility to learn Italian, and you really want to do that as a UCB staff member, and you cannot access these classes because they are reserved for students. Mm -hmm. You know. And uh, why why is that and why does that remain like that? So you will have to go to the Italian Institute and pay a lot of money, but you can't access it here. Mm -hmm. So it, it's all of these discussions. And I think for me, it's an EDI issue that we should be pushing. But as I said, I've tried from lots of different angles. I haven't gotten any further. And now, <laughs> now that you were saying this thing about the UN, I was thinking maybe we should just... Uh, have something where we look at the history of this mm -hmm. again and the same thing um yeah, there was uh, swahili taught at one stage as well i think that i don't know if it's still continuing and there was a lot of interest as well and we're building up a uh, global history degrees and we can't really get arabic into it because arabic is and like so and here we have a global language that is just constantly being denied access so you know there's a lot of these questions um, that that I find uh, I have no solution to it, but I think we can work on these solutions, you know. And but again, it's also about interesting people in that, mm -hmm. you know. And there's short-term possibilities, for example, where we could encourage. Now, my thing has always been, for example, for students, we always hear that students are afraid to go abroad. Mm -hmm. Um, to spend more than a holiday abroad. Mm -hmm. So um, 
but a lot of countries have these short courses where you can go for three weeks and whatever. So, you know, it's like you're going on a holiday, but you're doing a course on culture and language here. Could we not have uh, encourage, have more of those and promote them to students, maybe have a little raffle for uh, tickets uh, that the university pays some of the tickets so that you don't have that uh, high fee or something. You know, it, there's so many different things that we can do in order to bring in all of these components. Some want to learn languages, others want to learn local, others want different. All of this could be possible, but we just have to have somebody who sits there and looks at the logistics of it. Say on the subject of Polish, I think there's something like, and I'm terrible with figures, but I looked it up this morning, 175,000 people speak Polish daily in Ireland, mm -hmm. and 7,000 people speak Irish daily in mm -hmm. Ireland. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, you know, I don't, I, numbers don't mean much to me, but if you're into the qualitative, the quantitative thing, there you go. Um, for me, whether it's a tiny language like Nuare, which yes. is spoken in the valleys in Nepal. Mm -hmm. And the wonderful thing about Nuare is, or one of the wonderful things, is that um, if you want to say the chair is there, you have to specify how you know that chair is there. Mm -hmm. Now, a language like that is indicative of the wisdom and the care with which a community have fostered and built a tradition, a way of thinking, a way of believing, a way of interacting with one another, a way of being in the world. And when something like that is treasured, then you know we as humans are more valuable. You know, we value that in ourselves. And that's the one thing that we as humans can build is language. And there's that. And then the other language that came into my head that I was just thinking about, oh, it's gone out of my head. Sorry, for you. <laughs> an open door. Everything goes in and out. But just to say that um, those languages in the country as they are now, are such a huge resource. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, whether or not it's good for a community to yeah. treasure their culture, whether it's this or whether it's that, as a member of the majority English-speaking settled white community, mm -hmm. I think I have all of these resources. Somebody who speaks Oza, Oza and somebody who's speaking French, somebody who's speaking sign language, these are resources. Mm -hmm. You know, if it were gas or oil or anything like that, we would be mining it to death. Mm -hmm. And yet language is still not seen mm -hmm. as this incredible resource built by humans. And every time we hold a breath, we, we speak a language, our breath touches those words, we leave our DNA behind on that language. Mm -hmm. And there's something so beautiful about language. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. And, and people make a lot of effort, grassroots efforts, to mm -hmm. maintain them in lots of different ways. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I just just to point out that there's the plurilingual thing as well. Mm -hmm. So you know we can keep if we keep sticking words from all the languages we know into everything we say, if we, you know, there's deaf, deaf poetry, sign poetry. I mean, it's just, I'm a poet. Um, <laughs> just <laughs> about. Um, but just to say, um, you know, I think if we can keep doing that, you know, we can, and English in a way is a language which has lots of holes in it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we can keep sticking those things in, maybe we can stretch English wide enough, but yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to keep it short. <laughs> I mean, that was mind blowing. Uh, and just thank all the panelists for just such a rich uh, discussion. Um, I think one of the issues that really struck me throughout um, was what you were saying, Rain, about human rights and like the example of that you were giving uh, in relation to people receiving international protection and just how language impinges on all aspects of life. But it can be actually a life or death issue, you know, whether it's about your migration status or whether it's about your physical or mental health or um, whatever. And just on that note, I think a lot of speakers brought up about professionals across various uh, disciplines and various areas. As we know, a lot of professions in Ireland are still predominantly white, Irish, monolingual, you know, mindset, that kind of thing, you know, and like you were talking about the Gardaí, for instance, medical professionals, um, 
various others, even within the university environment, you know, to what extent, uh, especially within the university environment, where not only do we employ people, we also train people, kind of the next generations mm -hmm. that go into these professions, speech and language therapy as well, um, that, you know, what can we do to foster that multilingualism and to actually, it, it's about inclusion, really, you know, I mean, while universities maybe are better than, you know, maybe other institutions in terms of diversity, you have to question what kind of diversity. And many people are coming from a refugee-seeking background that are employed in our universities, or study, have, have, you know, the ability to study in our universities because of so many barriers, um, whether it's status, time, financial resources, whatever. And then what hope is there that we have speakers of particularly languages um, that don't have that kind of globalised status and don't have that power, because it really comes down to power. Um, how do we um, maybe use whatever resources we have as individuals or as institutions to break down those barriers? to enable students and staff to come into our <laughs> to question things like um, other professional bodies because there's an awful lot of qualified people here and they're dealing with language issues but to be honest it's not just a language issue it's about recognition of qualifications mm -hmm. uh, and you know if universities were to exert some pressure there you would end up with a much more diverse workforce a much more diverse community you know and enabling um, people uh, and you know right from children upwards um, to to have proper access to all those walks of life that at the moment can be very exclusive and uh, and very penalizing uh, on them so what can we do in a word what you are saying it's it's it goes back to the access uh, uh, especially from our community exactly what we are talking about those are the barriers that uh, that are there uh, to access that 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 education uh, because of the status uh, they are, are just a quick one uh, there is a scheme that the minister for justice uh, two years ago now uh, to give kind of an amnesty to to people that have been longer in the in the country with no with no status and, and they granted that status leave to remain, but now a person that has got that kind of status cannot qualify to get a grant from the government to get to to education. Okay. Yeah. No, yeah. And the important thing that has happened in 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 some of the, in these in these universities is the universities of sanctuaries. In a small way, they've helped a lot of people in, who are marginalised, who are, cannot be funded, who are subject to to, to non-EU fees, who are in that eight euros per per, per per week, who have got no hope. And the universities of century came with that, and those are the kind of things that need to continue mm. uh, uh, to help the others that are, that are coming in. I know the numbers are, uh, are huge, but in a small way, those are the kind of things that need to continue in all the universities throughout to make sure that there is access yeah. to the access programs, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and then I think on the other side of it, we have an obligation to, and we will, you know, this year, the Higher Education Authority has required all higher education institutes to put in place a racial and ethnic equality action plan. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, in Trinity, we just had our president provost sign off on the commitments, the principles of that last Friday. So this is a new, new thing. Um, but in there, we're looking at things like what are the pipelines to progression? You know, so it's grand to say we bring students in through sanctuary funded programs yeah. or we bring in international students. Um, we hear from students, you know, particularly from black students, particularly say, for example, I, I think at the School of Nursing in Midway for Infinity, there is a good, strong cohort of a very diverse student body, but they're not seeing that represented in the, the staff makeup. So we have an obligation over time to think about the diversification and to think about how do we support the pipeline of progression in the way that the, the sector has looked at gender equality 
and progression for women over the past eight to ten years. Yeah. You know, that we, we really do. We need to be thinking about things more intersectionally, mm-hmm. and we need to be thinking about what do we do to support and make possible. But I, you know, when you were t- when you were talking, when you were talking, Rona, it makes me think also of your work, Steve. Uh, around you know accentism and the biases that people present you know so when it comes to interviews how are we training job interview panels um you know academic departments who are going to do the recruitment to make sure that they're looking beyond or or conscious of their biases around um you know maybe it's it's accent um from the north side so i have a good l jump in accent (laughs) but you know but is it about you know accentism like that is it about um Speakers of, of languages other than English and how they are perceived and then uh, responded to. But going from seeing, you know, language, um, to going to a point where we really do value language diversity as a resource. I think that has to be something fundamental. And I think part of the way we do that is by making sure that we make this an equality, diversity yeah. and inclusion. I think so. Yeah. Fundamentally, yeah. a part of what we're doing there. Yeah. Francesca, did you want to come in there uh, on, the, on the question of education? Yeah, because I think two questions or two comments come in. I think they are linked. They're two sides of the same problem because uh, first there was a question around kind of inspiring new learners of languages to take up a range of languages and to take take them up, not to go abroad, but to actually be used. Um, and then it's like, okay, well, there's a lot of professionals that would need to have language knowledge or we we might we believe uh, it would be a, a real advantage if they did and i think in a way we seen from the point of view of education um i see even just this week i was with a group of um early childhood educators in kildare and they the the managers hired staff from different countries because in early childhood education, in preschools, crashes, uh, there's people who come from uh, qualifications from abroad and they can work here. People can do a short course and they access the profession and they stay in, in the job. Then primary changes completely then because the requirements to become a primary school teacher are different. So you can't come in with an Italian qualification and teach in Irish schools. And whenever I was training primary school teachers in Ireland and I said, OK, what languages can you speak? They said, we don't speak any other languages other than English, which is not true because they've just been to school and they have learned languages. So, of course, they feel, they may have a perception that they would like to know languages better, but also they are learning languages that they feel are not going to be needed in school because they might need Arabic while they in school they were offered German. So while having learned German can definitely help them in learning Arabic and other languages going forward, there is a little bit of a mismatch as well in the languages that we learn in school and then what we need in the workplace in terms of responding to the needs of the communities that we're living in, because then Polish may be a more important language in a certain area uh, compared to French. Maybe French is more spoken in another area. And maybe schools could be reflecting in the offering of languages, the languages of the communities. And of course, what teachers always say, I can't learn every single language. Of course, we're not, that's not the expectation. But imagine if every primary school teacher had to know a language other than English and Irish and potentially French or German or Spanish or Italian. And then having a language such as Romanian, Polish, Ukrainian. And we've seen it now with the latest uh, kind of high number of people from Ukraine having the need to receive services, to access services. And there's been a massive renewed interest in, okay, uh, do we know someone who speaks this language, who works in healthcare, who works in schools, who works in mediation with parents, in therapy? So suddenly it's like, oh, ah, language is important. Language is not just a little extra that we do. So I think it's still like the mindset, when I talk about the mindset, it's not the mindset of us in this room or the people in our networks. It's really saying okay if language is so vital why is it not a requirement for a primary school teacher 
to have strong knowledge in a community language. Uh, now, Ireland is one of the few countries, it's, it's actually amazing that you can do the leave insert in a heritage language, which is great. There's a huge offering of short courses in Lithuanian, in languages that in other countries people can't even imagine uh, that being the case. So it is a huge opportunity that the country has to really stress the importance of multilingualism for day-to-day -day living and not just for traveling, not just when I, well, the thing that came to my mind first, when the first example was brought up, when I came to Ireland, I started to teach Italian and everyone in one of my classes was a husband of an Italian or a wife of an Italian. And I know it sounds very materialistic as a, as a reason for, uh, or a very utilitarian reason for learning a language. But truthfully, these people were really keen because they wanted to understand their in-laws, they wanted to travel and so on. But it was a language that suddenly was in their family. It wasn't a language that I'm going to book a hotel. It's like it's, it's now the language of their family. And more and more families are going to be multilingual and they're going to have two or more of family languages. So I think this also hasn't been fully understood by people who are making policies. Mm -hmm. Any more questions or shall we call it an evening? Mm -hmm. Well, thanks very much to the panel, uh, Dr. Francesco Laborgia, Professor Bettina Vigge, uh, Professor Lorraine Leeson and Lucky Kambule. Uh, thank you all. Uh, you're all warmly invited to uh, refreshments uh, in the next room. Uh, and everybody watching at home, you were also invited to Russians in your own home. <laughs> in my language, we have all I think. Well, thanks again. Thank you.